Um, hello and welcome to the fourth meeting of the uh, seminar series on uh, responsible AI in medicine, hosted by the Bioethics and Law Center at uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, my name is Owen Asman, and I will moderate uh, today's event. Do you hear me? Good. Um, so, well, because you might just be polite. Um, our center's uh, mission is to foster interprofessional collaboration and education in bioethics, health law, and medical humanities. And this uh, seminar is a platform that encourages open exchange of uh, ideas and we aim to broaden our collective understanding of responsible AI in medicine. Health research is uh, an important topic to consider, and I'm quite sure we will learn more about this today. Uh, it seems to be something that warrants uh, more discussion in this regard. So, you know, the use of a variety of digital technologies in health research, including mobile apps and wearable sensors, uh, the concepts of machine learning, artificial intelligence is, I think, exciting, but possibly not risk-free. Every good thing is connected with some risks. So if that is the case, we may need to balance between harnessing the powers of these technologies and ensuring protection and respect for human dignity and rights. And to help us understand and navigate these complexities, uh, we're very honored um, to have with us uh, today uh, our uh, guest, um, Dr. Camille Nebeke. Her expertise in research integrity, innovation, and digital technologies will provide us with uh, an opportunity to learn about these ever-evolving uh, topics and hopefully to have a lively discussion later on on the ethical, possibly regulatory related challenges in the sphere of digital tools used in health research. Um, before we begin, I would like to express my uh, heartfelt gratitude to uh, my colleague, Dr. Amir Tal, uh, for his continued efforts in making our seminar so up-to-date and uh, exciting. Uh, Amir and I will serve as guest editors of a special theme issue on responsible generative AI in mental health. Uh, it will be published in uh, the Journal of Medical Internet Research, Mental Health. Uh, so the call for papers and more information will be available soon on the journal website and uh, our website, the uh, seminars website. And you're invited to contact either of us if you have a paper that you consider uh, working on, or maybe you wanna submit it for review. Um, and now it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Camille Nebeke, the director of the UC San Diego Research Ethics uh, Program. Uh, Dr. Nebeke, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Oren. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I know it's evening your time. It's early morning on the California coast, and I'm just really honored to be a, a guest speaker for you today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so as, as you've heard, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the role that technologies are playing in health research, which is the precursor to putting these tools into the healthcare uh, workflow. And so I, um, I would say it was back in 2013, I joined the faculty at UC San Diego. I had come from uh, San Diego State University, which is another uh, university in the San Diego area. So I joined UC San Diego faculty in the Division of Behavioral Medicine in our School of Public Health and was contacted by several of my colleagues who were doing what they thought of as the precursor to precision medicine. They wanted to know how people behaved in the wild, how we could collect information about people passively without having to bring them into the lab to complete surveys or to have them recall what they did on any specific day. And they told me they couldn't get approval from our institutional review board. And so they asked me to consult with them. And that's what's opened this door for me to be really uh, intrigued by the new ways of collecting information about people in the wild. And, you know, whether it's through artificial intelligence, using big data sets or wearable sensors, 
that led me to really wanting to find out how do we shape ethical practices as we move into this digital age. So it's been, uh, I guess it's been coming up on 10 years now that I've been working in this field. And about five years ago, we opened up the Recode Health Center, which is um, supported with seed money through UC San Diego. And the Recode Health Center is really focusing on helping to shape ethical research practices in digital health. And to do that, we have funding from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and other sources that have really spearheaded our ability to do empirical research on, on how to do research ethically in this, in this space. So today, what I'm going to be doing is identifying how we're using these different tools and strategies in health research. Um, I, I will also talk a bit about some of the challenges we've experienced. I'm, all, I'm involved as a committee member for the UC Health System AI committee and just learning about how the health systems are starting to be um, using ChatGPT, uh, using um, different kind of plugins in their, in their electronic health records to do predictive analytics and some of the things that they've had to really think through before they implement these practices. So I focus on the ethical, legal, and social implications. I'm going to break that down into buckets of what those mean. And then talking about a digital health decision support framework that we've developed. And I did that in collaboration with Dr. John Torres and Dr. Rebecca Ellis. Um, back in 2017 is when we started to develop this, this framework and, and a, a, comp, a companion checklist. So those are the objectives of my talk today. Um, these are only a few of the many, many people that have been involved in helping to shape Recode Health. And this is um, a snapshot of people that we are collaborating with that are from industry, from government organization, nonprofit organizations, professional societies, obviously students who are working with us in our lab. And so this is, again, one of one of just a, a few of the many people who have been involved in helping to champion the work that we're doing at Recode Health. So as I mentioned, I want to talk about the ethical, legal, and social implications. And when I think about the ethical um, lane or bucket, I'm thinking about ethical principles, respect for persons, beneficence, justice, um, and how those play out in practice. And so informed consent is a big part of how do we do this kind of research. Um, it's the topic of a lot of our studies. And I was listening to a few of your past webinars and, and was really intrigued by the conversations that you have had and the discussions about informed consent, because it's really an important discussion to be having. And as we move into the space of digital technologies, the need to have a sense of data literacy, of technology literacy, and how do we convey the granularity of data and the volume of data that can be gathered through these different kinds of sensor technologies is so critically important. But how do we convey that to an individual in a way that they can truly consent if there is even a practice of consent. And so that's also a debate about at what point in time do we need to get consent? Can we truly get con informed consent using our, our standard methods? We're also very interested in bystander rights. With these new technologies, it could be a wearable camera, it could be a microphone. You're picking up people that are bystanders. And so while the person who is wearing the different technologies can consent, to wear these different technologies in real time in the wild, the people that they're around are not consenting. But what's interesting is that they're also not research participants. They're not the object of study. And so as per our federal regulations in the US, they would not be considered a human subject in research, nor would they need to consent. But that doesn't mean that that's necessarily respectful. And so we're really thinking about how do we demonstrate the principle of respect for not only the research participant, but for people in, in the vicinity of that person. We're evaluating the risks of harm. Uh, we're evaluating that in relationship to the benefits to people like those who are in the study, as well as to society at large. And we're also really wanting to pay attention to social justice. 
because technologies may require some kind of broadband or some kind of infrastructure, we want to make sure that people who are likely to benefit from the research are able to be included in the studies. When we think about the legal implications, we're looking at regulations and law. These are things like the federal regulations, intellectual property law, conflict of interest, privacy practices. So in the EU, we have the GDPR. In California, we have a, a relatively novel privacy regulation. It was the first in our country um, to protect uh, personal data that is outside of the health record. And we're also thinking about liability. So that's where we go with, with the legal implications. And then social implications are the downstream impacts. What is it we need to be thinking about that we don't necessarily know right now, but could be a problem for either an individual or a group of people? We're thinking about are there things that we can know downstream that we may not even know we can know at this point in time? And how do we build those in as we're developing these systems? We're also thinking a lot about how do we train designers and technology developers about how to think about these, these issues that may not be front and center for their education. So that's part of our National Science Foundation grant. It's um, focusing on ethical and responsible research among those who are building socio-technical systems that are going to be deployed in health systems. So the computer scientists and engineers that are developing these tools, where in the flow of their education are they getting exposure to these ethical, legal, and social implications? And so when I think about this ecosystem, I'm always thinking about who are the stakeholders involved and how do we what, what are each of our responsibilities in shaping ethical practices in this digital age? And so when I first started this work and the researchers asked me to come to meet with them and they said, you know, we cannot get our protocols approved by our institutional review board. I don't know what it's called in, in Israel, but it's research ethics committees in many places. But it's the group, the body of people who review research to make sure that people are protected from harm. It's an, it's a, an objective body that should be looking at the, these, these studies. Well, the IRB didn't understand how to think through what they needed to know when somebody was wearing a sensor or a camera. Some of the IRBs didn't think it was a problem at all, and other IRBs thought it was a huge problem and wouldn't allow the study to move forward. So we needed to start thinking, well, if the IRB is not the expert group, who should the expert group be? And that really led us to thinking about what is the researcher's role in shaping ethical digital health practices? Because if the researchers get it wrong, we lose public trust, we, we can't take that risk. And so it really puts a lot more um, responsibility on researchers because we can't outsource. We can't outsource to research ethics committees because they don't have the capacity or the training to know how to think about these things. And so we really do need to take responsibility and start thinking about how do we build capacity among the people developing the technologies, the people that are choosing the technologies, um, who the end user is. So all along this, this pathway, we need to think about how do we build that capacity. This is a, a graph that we created just to show all of the different data sources that exist nowadays that didn't exist 10, 20 years ago. So the human genome has been a real big focus of a lot of our research. And you know the, the ethical, legal, social implication acronym came out of that, um, that focus of, of genetic and genomic research. We're borrowing it and applying it to digital health. But as you can see in this figure, we can collect information about human lifestyle behavior and health from environmental sensors that are placed on buses, that are placed in different parts of our cities. We get air pollution. We, we can know what areas are more toxic than others. Um, we've had access to the electronic medical record for a very long time, but it's very limited in terms of what we can know and you know and and how we're applying artificial intelligence and and machine learning to what for us has been a billing system it's not necessarily designed up front for for use in training ai and then we have access to twitter and facebook you know those uh, social networks are not only being used for subject recruitment 
but deploying interventions and also grabbing all of this granular data to do predictive analytics. So the sources of health data are so much more broad than they were a decade ago or 15 years ago. So we really have to be thinking outside the box about how, how we are doing our research moving forward. So this is a, you all, you know, we have smartphones and the smartphones have been used for a long time to deploy tools like ecological momentary assessment. So instead of asking somebody to recall two weeks from now, you know, what their, what their diet was or to record it every evening on a notebook at their home, you can deploy a survey to their, their phone and ask people to reply, have you exercised today? What have you eaten today? What is your heart rate? I mean, you can do all kinds of things with ecological momentary assessment. And now there's just all kinds of apps and, and different kinds of uh, uh, mobile apps that are being used in research that are deployed on, on smartphones. This is the camera that got me involved in, in this research completely got me involved in this research because this was the wearable camera that the IRB's uh, research ethics com committee was having such a hard time with. So you would wear this around a, a lanyard on your neck. It was um, produced by Microsoft probably about 20 years ago to help people with dementia. So people that were having difficulty remembering what their day was about, they would wear this camera and it would take a picture about every seven seconds. It was activated by light, by by temperature. And so you could have, a, you know, after wearing this camera for a week, you'd have about 35,000 images in, in the recording that you could reconstruct what your day-to-day -day life was like. But my colleagues wanted to use it to see what people did when they were just behaving in their everyday life. And so they recruited people um, from what we have here is a, a thing called Craigslist. Do you have that in Israel where you just can sell things and buy things? And well, they recruited people on Craigslist. They were looking for um, healthy individuals that were between a certain age range, like 18 to 85. And they just said, hey, we want people to wear these different devices for a week. You answer a survey, bring back the equipment. And so there was no intervention. It was just observational research. And this was the first study that they could not get approval to do. So that's when I said, you know, we have to start learning about what the risks are of wearing this camera, what kind of consent would be appropriate. Um, we have to educate the IRB and we have to do it in a way that is very systematic. And they said, we don't have time to do that kind of research, nor do we know how to do that research. And so I started collaborating with my colleagues to figure out how do we do this. This is a, a sensor that was developed by Todd Coleman that you put on your skin. It's about an inch and a half by an inch. He, um, he makes these sensors and you can see here that they capture temperature, ECG, EEG. Um, it has a wireless antenna, photo detectors, a wireless power coil. So it is able to transmit human physiological data to a, a, a smartphone that goes straight to the clinician's office. And so the cases where he's used this, in one case, it was a pregnant mom who's at home. He's able to measure um, contractions and give some idea of when this person should go to the hospital. Maybe, um, and the other, I'm working with him right now on another study where we have put sensors in an eyedrop bottle. So around the eyedrop bottle, you squeeze the bottle, you tip it and put it in your eye. So you can timestamp when that drop was exiting the bottle. You can't tell if it entered the eye, but you can tell whether or not this person is using their eye drop bottle in the times that they're supposed to be delivering this drop to their eye. So this is a medication adherence study that is looking to see how can we improve medication adherence among those with glaucoma. Um, so these these sensors again are capturing some really important information when i first started talking to this group about using the eye drop bottle and then they can cross reference it with claims data and they can reference it with the electronic health record so these three different sources of data could in fact prove that this person is not adhering to their medication now if i don't adhere to my medication and my insurance company finds out about it they may think i'm too risky to insure and so you're working with an underrepresented population, in this case, Latino and African-American patients who may 
run the risk of losing their insurance if they participate in a study that's using this technology the way that it was initially designed. And so by working with my group in this study, we're, we're planning to do interviews with the patients after they've completed the eye drop portion of the study. We'll know the extent to which they're compliant or not compliant, but then we can learn about what gets in their way. What makes it difficult to comply with the medication? Why, why would they have, you know, what would help them stay more aligned with the, with the um, schedule? And so we'll do interviews with a hundred of these patients to find out more. What about the root cause is, you know, can we, can we develop interventions for and develop an app interface that might be something that resonates with what would motivate them to use their, their medication? This is um, something, again, I, I, I saw the um, webinar that you did with uh, Vardy a couple months ago, and she's also working with us on, on Bridge to AI. And this is something that I was actually interviewed about several years ago, where the voice recording can be used to detect Parkinson's and other diseases. And so if your voice can be used to detect disease early, is that a risk or a benefit? I think it's an exciting benefit, but there are also things that we need to be wary of, just as I mentioned with the with the eye drop bottle. You know, if you can tell that somebody has a, a you know, may have early onset of something, you can certainly treat it, but I worry about the potential for discrimination and potential loss of insurance. So as long as people are not stigmatized and not discriminated against, which are the two big issues that underlie pretty much all of these risks is that that uh, discrimination we're going to have we'll be okay if we can get uh, if we can figure out how to address that and then all of these different kinds of platforms um, are being used by digital epidemiologists to do predictive analytics to really start to better understand you know you, you've read articles about the the algorithms that are being used by Facebook to do predictive analytics about mental health and suicide ideation and deploying uh, counselors or emergency vehicles to somebody's home. So you know clearly these can be useful, but we have to build in ethical practices at the front end and not wait for a catastrophe to happen. And, and again, you know, where are people consenting? This is something I just pulled off the internet yesterday. You do a search for commercial wearable sensors and boy, it's just everything. Um, and I, I don't know what's going to come up tomorrow, but, you know, it's like every time I do this, it's something new that is, it's out there on the internet. So, you know, sensor technologies are commercial products. And one of the things that we really need to be thinking about with commercial products, and this is the case for, you know, this is a social media. So this is coming off of, of a platform like Facebook. You can identify relationships in Facebook and predict the likelihood that somebody has is obese, just based on their friends. Their network of three friends can tell you what their lifestyle and, and potential obesity is. What's happening with these different kinds of sensors, as you can see here, the wearable camera, you capture a lot about what that person's, he's sitting, eating a salad, you can get the portion size, you can see there's a TV, um, you could also pick up people in the room if they happen to be in that room, so we also have the bystander rights in there, this is a GPS monitor along with an accelerometer that's tracking where this person is going throughout the day, this has been changed to protect that person's privacy. But you can see that they. this is the border of Mexico and California. So you can see this person's going over the border back and forth. Um, but it, it captures really very, very sensitive data that when reviewed by the IRB, never ever came up as a risky kind of data. So this is why, again, we as researchers and clinicians need to be very conscientious about what the data can tell us. And there's an app called Strava that cyclists use to um to track their rides and in the UK somebody figured out well I know where these people are I know what kind of bikes they have I know when they take their rides and they they stole 300 bicycles because they could and you know it's because of these kind of data 
Um, so anyway, the, the new sensing tools pick up a lot of new kinds of data that are outside the electronic health record. They aren't protected. So we have to come up with new ways of thinking about what is the right way to go about protecting data that we have control over. And when you use a commercial technology, you don't have control over the data. So when using these kind of things for research, the terms and conditions of use violate our federal regulations for human research protections. And yet Fitbit is one of the most popular wearable sensors used in research. Fitbit a couple years ago was being considered for the, the All of Us Research Program, which is the NIH Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, they wanted to be the partner. I pulled this, um, this snippet out of uh, Fitbit's terms and conditions of use that demonstrated that it absolutely violated our federal regulation, which says that we cannot take away somebody's right to sue if they're harmed. Well, this said, you can't sue us if you're harmed. Well, Fitbit at that time worked with the NIH to come up with a research-friendly terms and conditions of use. Then they were able to be partners with the NIH, and then Google bought Fitbit. So I have no idea if this still exists, if their research-friendly terms and conditions of use is still working. But these terms and conditions have to be read by researchers so that you can convey to people that you want to enroll in your study what they need to be aware of. And terms and conditions and privacy policies are not there to protect people. They're there to tell you what the company is doing with your data, who they share it with, when they share it, what other things that they might sell, donate, um, those, that's what's in there. And, you know, if they have a privacy agreement, which most of them will, that's what they're there for. So I, I think as researchers, we can't count on a research ethics committee reading all of these terms of service and figuring out what they need to include. We have to do it. So the digital health research questions that we've been focusing on um, are really thinking about how AI can make clinicians more efficient and effective, um, whether our systems and norms and regulations are still relevant and responsive. We're looking at data management and trying to think through what are the best practices for data collection, storage, and sharing. We want to think about how we might reimagine consent so that people are actually informed and not just go through this transaction and get a signature. We really want people to know what is happening under the hood. And I think that's part, you know, with Bridge to AI, we're really responsible for creating an ethically sourced and trustworthy data repository. What does that mean in, in practice? Um, so that's, that's a lot of what we're trying to do right now. So here are just a couple of snapshots of studies that we've done. We wanted to see how IRBs were evaluating risk. So we looked at a lot of IRB determination letters, the, the letters that went back to researchers after their protocols were reviewed to learn more about how the IRBs were thinking about these things. We did focus groups with IRBs to try to understand how they might wanna work together to learn from each other. Um, we did studies of part with participants to find out whether or not what we thought we were conveying to them in the informed consent actually was something that was useful to them. Um, whether or not what we said about privacy and bystanders, did they hear it? Because, you know, at the front end of a study, when you hear a lot of stuff, you don't always remember. It's a lot of cognitive overload. And so after this, this group had, had worn the camera and different sensors on their wrists and on their legs, they came back a week later and we asked them about the camera and then we said, did you like use the privacy button? Did you give, give bystanders the card if people asked you why you were wearing this camera? And they, you know, a lot of them said, oh, I kind of forgot about that privacy button. And, um, you know, my friends thought it was really cool, so I never had to use the card to explain why I was wearing it. Um, many people complained about the wrist-worn device because the wristband started to stink, and then it also didn't match their clothing. So engaging with people about what you're doing up front can tell you so many things about what can go wrong. We did a study in City Heights, which is a neighborhood nearby, that has a very diverse community. A lot of people from Sudan and um, 
just, you know, a lot of different places, a lot of our refugee community members are, are living there. And they, we, we were doing a community-based participatory study where they were helping us to define the questions. They wanted to learn about nutrition because they were noticing that their teenagers were gaining weight once they resettled in the U.S. And they didn't, they couldn't find the, the um, rest, the ingredients that they normally use to cook with. And so they wanted to do a study where they could learn more about nutrition and healthy eating. Part of that was to wear a wrist-worn device. Well, it turns out they wore it for a week, but in reality, none of them wore the wrist-worn device for a week. And turns out their culture and their, their prayer practices made it really awkward for them to have something on their wrist all the time. So they just chose not to wear it. So these are the kind of things I think are really important for us to understand about these different stakeholders. We looked at participant terms and conditions. This study was for kids like adolescents who were being enrolled in studies. Well, terms and conditions of use are really not designed for people to read nor understand. And they're typically written at at least a college age reading level or above. Um, and then we did the study with the NIH reporter where we were trying to figure out who's doing this kind of research. This was back in 2017. We, we did a, a scan of everything that was in the NIH reporter database and found that, that between 2005 and 2015, that the kind of research we're talking about, mobile imaging, wearable sensors, social media, had increased by 384%. And, you know, it was just really fascinating to watch the, the rapid growth of this kind of research. The kind of things that we're doing now, as I mentioned, we're involved in the Bridge to AI. I'm part of the center, the core ethics group, but I'm also involved in one of the data generation projects, which is called AI Ready. And this is going to be recruiting 4,000 people from across the U.S. at three different locations. One's in Alabama, one in San Diego, and one in Seattle. And these are going to, we're recruiting underrepresented populations. Why would they want to be in the study? What would they be worried about? So we're forming a community advisory council so that we can have their insights. We can learn about what their concerns might be. We could then modify the protocol to make it something that they would feel comfortable being involved with. We want to learn about what are their expectations? How do they want to be communicated with? And this is very different. So the research teams might not be thinking about what the participant wants or what would motivate them. Once they get their data, what's the motivation to have any kind of bi-directional rapport? We're learning that people really want to know what's being learned from their data. And so how do we do that in a way that's sustainable is one of our questions. We're, I mentioned this ethical and responsible research. This is work we're doing to learn more about how um, graduate programs are integrating research ethics education in, in the communities where people are doing um, developing these systems that will be capturing our data used for health. Um, Patient-engaged risk assessment. This is funded by PCORI. And this study, we're developing a checklist, um, a risk management tool. So that's part of the study is like, how do we assess risk in digital health research and make it so that it's not just one size fits all. We're really trying to understand, is what's risky for me risky for someone who has a different demographic makeup? And so in San Diego, for example, I mentioned that we're on the border of Mexico, so we have people that may not have documentation. And so that risk is different for a person being tracked with a GPS location sensor than it would be for somebody that is documented and has resident status. So, um, and, and culturally, these, these things matter. As I mentioned with our study in City Heights, it's um, some, some things will work and some things won't. So in, in our pair study, we're also really diving in on informed consent and trying to figure out how do we make it more informed. And I'll show you a graph in just a second. So again, um, these are the kinds of studies we're really focusing on community capacity building, informed consent, and risk assessment. So when I did an st initial study with older adults, we were doing a five-year longitudinal study where we wanted to look at healthy aging over that period of time. So it was an observational study that the participants were living in an independent living facility. So we had a community there 
they all signed up really quickly they signed this consent over here which is an approved irb consent because ucsd was involved they said if ucsd is involved we want to be involved we want in so they didn't read it but they can't read it anyway because even at a 12 point font people that are in an independent living facility may not have the eyesight even with corrective lenses it's hard to read so we asked them what would it look like if consent was designed for you and this is the prototype that we came up with for them they said I want to look at the table of contents I want to be able to click on a button and go to that part of the consent that I want to read about first I want to look to see if I'm reading it can I make the size of the font bigger can I put it into speech so I can listen instead of having to read it they wanted videos this in this study here they were collecting uh, microbiome so they had to have a stool sample they wanted to know what does that look like how do I do it and so they wanted videos of these different procedures so that they could see what it looked like so these are coming from people that want to be involved in research and they're trying to help us make it a better experience for them so that was our first prototype this is what we're doing now with chat GPT this is an informed consent that was approved by an institutional review board it's uh take you know it's a, it's what I call a snippet I just cut and pasted this here we're looking at what chat GPT did with that snippet which made it much shorter but is it okay did it shorten it to the extent that it took away information that's important so that's what we're asking people what's their preference for content do they like it this way do they like it this way do they like a combination of this so we're using actual studies to get input on what people like this is um I know this looks really kind of overwhelming because it it is this is what's in a consent form that we're using for our um, bridge to AI study this is what's in there and each one of these pieces corresponds like this is all the data management language this is what happens if you're going to be have data collected in person this is what's at home this is what happens afterwards and so we're trying to figure out is and this is all at the front end in one of those consent documents so we unpacked it now we're trying to find out are there things that you would want to opt into or out of would you like to have information over time which would be called more layered would you want it to do you want to have us talk to you about what's being learned about anything what are the questions being asked how do you want to know about this study over time so this is just this is what's under the hood and now our meeting we're actually having a meeting right now to talk about how are we going to deploy this into a into an interview protocol um we also ask people how do they want to get information back after the study so again this was the older adult community they said if you're going to be observing us for five years we want to know what you're learning now, I want to know what you're learning about me over time I want to know what you're learning about our group over time and so we published this paper in healthcare that talked about what we learned from focus groups where we were talking to the older adults about how they were currently using technology what they found frustrating what they, what they found was exciting what would they like to have that they don't have right now and we published the paper I mean it was super interesting because we found out that the scooters that they use to get around the plug is underneath on the bottom so they had to get on their hands and knees to find the plug plug it in and then hope that they could get back up I mean there were so many things about like even a remote control they can't the, but there's too many buttons you know and they can't figure out what they're what what to push this paper turned into a Forbes um contribution there was a, a person that took our paper kind of redid it and published it in Forbes and then this was the third one was a press release that our communication team put together about our study so we took those to a group at the retirement community and they said this is you know we would listen to them a lot and then we come back with with what we think we've heard them say which we want that um text to turn into an infographic so we took what we would maybe put into a poster and did some iterations on on what could be communicated back to people over time not only about them as individuals but about them as a group but in our studies we're not we're not funding ourselves to do this 
and our funding agencies don't require that we do this. And so where's the motivation to close the loop on this communication? So that's what another stakeholder we have to think about is our funders and what is what is what are they saying about informed consent? What are they saying about returning research information back to people? Not much, except they need to they need to start doing something about that. This is a, a study that we've been working on with um, National Institutes of, of Drug Abuse, and this is a, a wearable sensor that picks up mom and baby voice dialogue so you can you can you know you imagine if you have small children and you're trying to train your kid to sleep through the night you might hear a lot of crying so does the machine learning then pick up babies crying and that mom is not attending to the baby could some inferences be made that would be problematic um so i mean as these things get developed you have to have a lot of conversations with people who are using it to document what's actually happening in the house and this is a, a crib sensor that um, uh, this, the same person that I mentioned before, Todd Coleman and Kevin King have put together so that they can capture respiration, body movement, sleep patterns in babies and in, in adults and detect in, in this case here, sometimes it's about a baby. Sometimes it's about somebody recovering from um, cardiovascular disease and maybe they wanna monitor them when they're at home. And then this is a study where um, a baby is wearing this little sensor technology. And so the, the team has been asking people who were testing it what their experience has been so that they can uh, correct these problems before they deploy these sensors in, in real life. So again, this is a lot of uh, what we call human-centered design. And in closing, I'm just going to go over a tool that we've created because this is something that when I started recognizing that IRB's research ethics committees didn't have the ability to review these kinds of technologies with confidence that they would either miss risks or overthink risk, we, um, John Torres, Rebecca Ellis, and I started doing um, some focus groups with different stakeholders. We had clinicians, legal scholars, regulatory folks, ethicists, researchers and we started asking them like what is what is it you need to be thinking about and doing and so over time and we did this over a couple of years period we identified the ethical principles that we wanted to have ground a framework and these principles respect for persons beneficence and justice are in um, the belmont report and then respect for law and public interest was created by a group out of the department of homeland security that was worried about um, information and communication technologies. And so they created what's called the Menlo Report and added to the Be to the Belmont Report one more principle, respect for law and public interest. So we ground our framework in those ethical principles and these domains of access and usability, data management, risks and benefits and privacy, they, they are not siloed. They all bleed into each other, but those were the four main domains that came out of this iterative design process. And so this is a framework that we created for researchers to help them think through what tools they needed to, how, how to vet a, a technology before they made a decision to use it in their study. So for each one of these domains, we define it. So here, access and usability is about the product design and whether the end users are able to use the tool. We need to know how it works, um, how that information is communicated to the user through consent or terms of service. Has it been used with the target population? Are there accessory tools needed like a smartphone or internet access? And can the product be used both short and long term? So if the product is not being tested for those things, then we want our researchers to be asking about that. And so then the checklist is organized by ethical principles. And we have items here that a researcher can go through. Um, respect for persons is really talking, not in this case about a contract, but about a consent communication. And the rest of it, um, justice, respect for persons, beneficence, those are all things that you need to think about when you're writing your protocol, when you're writing your research plan. And so we go through each one of these domains. So privacy is about personal information collected and expectations of the participant or patient to keep the information secured. And if it's shared, 
We want to know what's collected, what's shared, why is it shared, and what control does the end user have? Risks and benefits as looking at the type of harm, the severity of harm, the duration of harm, the intensity, and with respect to AI, is it accountable and transparent? And so the assessment of the risks and benefits is really going to be influenced by the evidence available to support the reliability of the product, risk mitigation strategies, and recognition of unknown risks. And what's difficult here is many of the commercial products, you can't find any literature on them to show that they are effective. And what's out there is not robust. And so this is why, you know, really paying attention and thinking through. And again, the checklist here will is specific to risks and benefits and, and guiding the researcher about what to think about. Now, we're going to be mod modifying this to some extent based on the studies that we're doing. We used this to build the CA Notify, which is our, our COVID exposure notification application. So we used this to guide our system design we're going to be modifying this and using it to train research ethics committee members so that they will have a better ability um, to think through. We don't want research to, to be held up. And we found that, re that ethics review boards are often um, risk adverse. And so if they, if they perceive a risk, they'll halt the progress of what could be really important health research. So we really want to be supportive and um, try to move things forward in a, in a very purposeful way. And with that, I will close out by just recognizing our sponsors, the sponsors of our research, our partnerships with um, the Society for Behavioral Medicine, among others. We have many internal partners at UC San Diego who have been you know, just incredible collaborators that um, very fortunate to be in an environment where uh, I think we're advancing this field and, and it's just a pleasure to collaborate with all of you. And I will go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you very much, Camille. That was uh, quite, uh, I think, uh, comprehensive and uh, gives a lot to think about. And uh, as we have uh, people from different uh, universities, uh, different countries, and disciplines, uh, some of uh, them we know and some we're happy to uh, be introduced to now. I'm opening the floor for a discussion. So you may raise your hands or uh, possibly open your cameras if you wanna uh, be seen and uh, please join the discussion. So yeah, any questions, any thoughts? You can use a raise hand option. Um, yeah, I'm actually, uh, first of all, Camille, thanks indeed, like really impressive work by all means. And uh, we have a lot uh, to learn from uh, your work. And uh, um, I was wondering about uh, the gap between the research and the, and the practice, or if you wish, the at least, what I experienced uh, with the um, professionals in the field and also patients, there is like a, a, some kind of a digital divide. Uh, some of them don't really know what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, digital health or AI. And so what, what do you think uh, in terms of, uh, if, we're, if we're focusing on, on professionals, uh, what, what kind of training do you believe that would be most uh, effective to equip them with the necessary knowledge and, sk and skills to leverage AI and digital tools in that sense. And also to obviously be aware of both of the potential and, and the risk. Uh, is, uh, one question. And, and the other one is with, with the rapid development of AI and digital tools, we see that the landscape of health research is likely to really change in the coming uh, years or months even. How do we, um, um, how do you think that we can prepare ourselves to adapt to this really um, um, fast changes? Oh, that's a, those are great questions. When I think about the training pipeline um, with Bridge to AI, there is a, a you know, a concerted effort to bring the pipeline of trainees into a pathway where they're going to be, th these are clinicians, 
where they're getting training in machine learning and AI and data science and learning about informatics and how they can use these different kinds of tools in predictive analytics. So, you know, that's one step is to get it into the training programs of our, of our students. That doesn't help people that are already in the field that are not aware of how it can be used, not certain about you know, what they need to think about. There's concerns about, is it going to replace us? And so I think there needs to be a, a lot of work with, um, with in, in a hospital setting with tech, uh, with the nursing staff, with physicians assistants, with all of the different people that are facing the patient to think through. With ChatGPT, that was something that they started using at UCSD about three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, where they were looking at... Um, you know, just the the amount of of correspondence that the physician has to do every evening. And so what they started to do was use chat GPT to assist the the clinician in writing their notes. And then any communication that goes back to the patient, they disclosed that there was a generative um, AI involved in helping to shape the correspondence. So that transparency is there. And so some of the physicians are really gung ho on on having this kind of help. Um, but for patients, we really need to be thinking about how do we explain this to people in a way that is accessible, that's understandable. And when I, you know, I think about like with Bridge to AI, I've attended a couple of the ethics working groups and seminars that have been put on uh, by UCLA. And for the most part, I think it's computer scientists and engineers that are delivering the education and I don't understand it. You know, so coming at this from a, you know, public health background, behavioral science, I'm having to relearn. I, I mean, we all have to learn a, a whole lot about different disciplines to make this work. And I think that's what's really exciting about Bridge to AI. It's because it's bringing so many different disciplines together. And we've never had to really work with each other before. And so learning the language of each other, learning the practices and the methods, it's going to be a pretty steep learning curve. And all I can say is that we really need to build that in to pretty much everything we do. And that's why I'm spending a lot of time doing this kind of research to think about how do we bring the patient participant community along this ride? Because if they lack trust, if they don't feel like they've been part of the conversation, I think we've, we've missed the boat. Thank you. Yeah. Any more thoughts, uh, comments? Um ideas you want to share with us. Uh, Tommy, I think you may have wanted to say something before. So I'm, I'm going to use my uh, prerogative as having the microphone open. Um, so you talked about potentially giving trainings to IRBs or uh, ethics committees. I'm, I'm thinking about our university's ethics committee. So we get uh, different uh, requests uh, from different researchers in different fields, uh, they not automatically would I get only requests that uh, are in my field of expertise and vice versa. So in a way, uh, in some cases, people will get um, requests that are not in their field of expertise. It could be very elaborated or not. And and so I guess, uh, I guess it's um, you brought into mind that we may want to uh, look into that or potentially have this kind of discussion about the new types of uh, technologies and so on that are, are now more and more appearing. Uh, but I'm still thinking that what you said about it's either too quick to, to say no or to say yes, maybe it relates to some other things that relate to um, the burden of many um, papers presented or whatnot, or assuming that people are not going to ask to do something that is uh, extremely uh, unfair or th there could be a lot of biases with uh, how maybe ethics committees approach uh, researchers assuming they're going to do fair things and if it's evident it's horrible then they're going to say no. Uh, do you think it's any different when we talk about these technologies than it is with any other kind of research? I, th I think the traditional clinical trials are um, more familiar because they're more contained and manageable, whereas working with digital data, um, it's, 
I just think that the data management piece of this gets very complex because the data reside in different places. You can't just say it's in a locked filing cabinet in my office anymore. Right. And and I found that in, you know within our institution there aren't the infrastructure isn't in place. And so until you know we build the infrastructure, it's just going to take. I keep going back to this. It's going to take time. And it's it's almost like if you're going to build a building, you would have the HVAC, you'd have the the civil engineers and the street people. You'd know where the roads are going to go and where the parking is going to go, and you'd need to know you know who's when do the windows get put in. All of these different players have to be at the table, and I'm seeing AI and digital health moving into the space with an existing infrastructure that isn't there. It, it's not the right infrastructure to support what we're doing. And so I think that, you know, it, it's, you know, with when it comes to informed consent, this is something that I'm really curious about what you all think about it. So, you know, when your electronic health record is used, they don't see that as being something that consent is needed for because it's existing data. And so it can be used to, you use for machine learning, uh, predictive analytics, and people don't consent prospectively. And then when it and should they? I don't know. I'm just kind of curious about how do we how do we take this opportunity to educate people about how data in their health record is being used instead of having it in a seven point font on a form that they have to sign if they want treatment. They how do we educate? You know broadly about how data are being used. Now, when it comes to, um, you know, consent prospectively to contribute to a data repository, like what we're doing with Bridge to AI, um, you saw you saw the, the, the schematic of all that goes into that consent. How do we educate people? Uh, I mean, and I don't see the patients as being all that much different than our employees or our colleagues, you know, this is all new terrain. So how do we think of, of ourselves as all novices? And what does that training need to be so that we're all kind of, you know, raising the boat together? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And uh, Shlomit, please, yeah. Yeah, I was, I'm, I'm, hi, I'm a medical risk manager on top of being an ethicist. And I keep thinking, since you, you talked about the, the doctors at your, uh, at your, at the uh, San Diego hospital, letting the chat GPT help them with the correspondence. You know, when you try to communicate, communicate to a patient, you know, the release letter or whatever, it's hard enough, but to explain to her, that it's being done using chat. I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking, I don't have an answer. I'm just thinking about it with you. This is so complicated to, to do. And I, I'm not sure what's the right thing to do. And then if the patient uses this thing in court when he wants to do, do a legal suit, then it gets even more complicated, right? So I'm, I don't have answers. I just, that <laughs> it, it, it really uh, makes me think about it a lot as well. Uh, mm. I think it's that's spot on is that we have a lot of questions, a lot of questions. And I'm and really love the opportunity to have a forum like this where we can start asking them. But as a community, we really have to work together to think about how to answer these. And I and from focus groups that we did with IRB members and risk management and, and different stakeholders. We, we learned that they wanted to have what we call a learning community. And so mm -hmm. learning communities, you know, came about when the internet started and it was where people could come together to learn about something. It could be, I want to learn how to build a model car and people with expertise would come and people who were novices would come, but they all had that common interest. And when we did our, our data collection back in 2015, Right about, you know, it was it was really a, around the time that we were trying to figure out how do you use a wearable camera and a recorder in the, you know, on your body ethically so that, you know, what what are the bystander rights and what how what are the risks? And Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded us to do that work. And what we learned from people is they wanted this learning community. And so we created this thing that we call the Connected and Open Research Ethics Platform. We call it CORE for short, Connected Open Research Ethics. And we've had to rebuild it and it's been rebuilt. It's on a, on a platform called Discourse. 
And it's a place where people can share questions with one another or share their protocol. And they may say, I'm using a Fitbit with Latino adolescents in an urban area, and here's how I did it, and here's the mistake I made. This is what I would do differently so that we can all learn from one another. We had um, another case where a, a person was using, I think it was Twitter or Facebook to recruit people and didn't realize that chatbots were the people that were coming to enroll and they were taking money. I mean, so she had this really embarrassing moment where she didn't realize that chatbots would be a problem in recruitment. And so she wrote into our forum and said, I got duped and this is what I would do differently next time. And yes, we can all share those learnings in papers at some point, but I think sharing in real time and having a community that talks to one another and, and is willing to acknowledge when we make mistakes is super critical. And, and it's the only way I think we're going to be able to build this together and to share resources like with this webinar and your series. I've shared it with people at Bridge to AI so that they can take a look. There's also a really excellent webinar that the New England Journal of Medicine, it's a podcast actually on AI. And, you know, there's just really good resources that if we have a community where we can share this, it's going to help us all develop that capacity. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joel, you wanted to say something, please? Me? Yeah, Joel, Professor. Yeah, I, I, I just was convinced not to do any research in the future uh, with uh, AI. I can uh, use, I, there are a lot of uh, tools to do research without these uh, new tools that is so complicated to explain the page, to explain the IRB, to do the ethics, which is completely different. So. I don't know, it just hinder research all those precautions sometimes. I cannot do any research on defibrillators, whether it, because they say that it's a little device. I, it, it's amazing that sometimes all this uh, human use committee is just hindering research instead of, of uh, uh, developing it. The, the machines are wonderful. I mean, you can check uh, like in, the, all the policeman that is going with all this uh, camera. Now we you use it during my meal. Ah, fantastic. But I'm not going to do research on this. Convince me that I'll continue. I think we are challenging our students actually uh, in this direction now because we see the world changing and we know that they're going to be using and utilizing many AI-based tools in their work when they start working. Maybe they're already in the field. So, um, you know, we may feel that it's a challenge, but I'm not sure, Yoel, that it's very much different than many of the uh, issues that we just have in general, when people seem to be uh, presenting us with uh, questions that bother us when we just want to do our research. And I think what we're doing here now is looking at the issues that might really be problematic to see how we mitigate them, not necessarily say, let's just not do AI-based research that I think, I'm sure you don't really think that because you've been doing a lot of innovation during your work, your life uh, cycle as a professional. Uh, but the question is, how do we do it in a responsible manner? And uh, th that's just my thought, I'm sorry. I, yeah, Camille, I, I kind of barged in. No, no trouble. And I'm, you know, I, I the, the issues are not all unique. It's all about data management. It's about privacy. It's about respect. You know, th those are not new issues. It's just having to think through a little bit differently. And I am a big advocate for not wanting to hold up research. I would love to see it move forward because I think that what we learn, we I don't I don't like to see things held up. Now I have a. a direct message in here saying your thoughts on the debate to put AI usage on hold until regulation in this domain will, will mature. Um, I would love to know how to do that. I don't mm -hmm. think it's, I just can't imagine that, but I also am thinking about CRISPR, Cas9, and that debate when that came out and what the, the world had to come together to come up with some norms of what would be acceptable practice and, you know, I, I see a lot of different convenings about AI and regs and what the standards should be. And I honestly don't know if there has been a collective voice of 
here, here's where we're drawing the line, line in the sand, because it's not just academic research organizations anymore. It's, it's big tech, and it's a lot of different groups that I just think it's fascinating. And I'm, 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 you know, a little anxious and also very happy that we're having these kind of conversations. I see a couple more hands. Megan? Yeah. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. One, I just want to thank this group. I happen to live in a fairly isolated part of the United States. And so being able to interact with all of you is amazing and definitely helps me in the classroom. Um, the one thing I just wanted to add, and I've heard a few people mention it, but um, I know that I rely on my students for a lot of tech information because they're faster and smarter at this than people of my generation are. And I was, I'm very hopeful to hear um, what you guys were saying about, you know, broadening, not just necessarily the research, but the conversations, um, because those students know more about AI than I do at this point. Um, and so having them be part of where we look to go for research or how things develop, I think especially on this topic is so much more important because while we might be good at ethics, I will 100% say I am not very good at the AI part of it. So again, thank you. I, this is a great forum and I'm very, very happy to have the invite to participate. Thank you. Uh, Anna, please. Uh. Oh, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. So I, um, I wanted to thank Oren for the initiative and this conversation, which is both fascinating and informative. And Camille, thank you so much. Um, you did quite an extensive uh, presentation and it was quite eye-opening. I do want to address two challenges about AI, the first of which is being the difference in pace. Uh, if we talk about regulatory um, changes these things take time a lot of time and if we look about and we, if we look uh, at ai which started to be used extensively in the last six months uh, the changes it caused in this short period of time are quite pervasive and quite extensive and if we compare it to regulatory worlds um, then the changes you can do in the same amount of time is quite limited which is one of the uh, main challenges I see. Uh, if you want to regulate and uh, develop uh, guidelines and uh, practical, you know, um, practical uh, laws and regulations. And the second thing is, is the second thing is um, the use of AI by different groups. We focus on research and ethics, but AI is used both by well, students and the general public, and as you said, big tech companies and uh, different interest groups, and all of them uh, pull this technology into different directions with different interests. And the question is, how do we address this, um, you know, communication and the fact that this well, quite a powerful tool can be used by so many different groups to so many different, um, you know, purposes as a opposed to CRISPR technology, which is quite narrow and has very few applications. Camille, you want to respond to uh, that? It's a, it's a really good point. And when I think about regulatory, um, the, the pace of regulatory change, I think it was in 2011 that the Code of Federal Regulations that protects human research participants in the U.S., was the changes were initiated. It was called an advanced proposal for, I, I can't remember what it stood for. Um, but then it, it took until 2017 before it started getting more public vetting and it had to do with elections. You know, they wanted to pull it back because, you know, the, this these different things were happening with, with the federal elections. And then in 2017, it goes back out for um, uh, the Federal Register becomes open, so for public comment. And about that time, two of the senior people from the Office of Human Research Protections had visited our campus. And I had given talks on digital health and these different tools. And I said, what about the federal regulation speaks to any of this new technology? And they didn't know anything about it when they started to draft new technology. 
and they didn't incorporate it even when they started to hear more about it. And so then that new regulation gets passed in 2018 and implemented and it doesn't, it's not responsive. So you think about the eight years that it took for that federal regula that regulatory update to happen in the US. Um, I don't think that regulations are the answer. I think we have to have some standards and norms within our professional communities that we are, we have to be somewhat self-regulating at this point in time. I just don't think we can wait for federal mandates or I don't know how long the GDPR took either. So um, I just, how do we get to a position, you know, when I think about a venture capitalist funding um, a startup company, do they care if they have an ethics board? They probably never ask because their their motivation is not that it be done ethically, that it that it create value so that they can make money. So the tensions of doing something responsibly, does it always have to conflict with doing something ethically? So I don't think that until we have some standards and norms in place that we're, you know, can agree upon. And then, you know, the other thing that, that we've been talking about is it's not just one discipline or society. I've, I've gone to so many different meetings over the last 10 years. Well, ideally, well, it was before COVID, COVID hit, but I would be at, at uh, information science meetings, computer science and engineering meetings, biomedical engineering, informatics meetings. I would be going all over the place where I normally would never, ever be because that's where people were talking. And so they're talking in these different silos. How do we bring that together? I, I just don't know at this point how we do that. I think Bridge to AI is a starting point because there are four data generation projects. Each one of those four projects has probably 50 to 60 people that are coming from different disciplines, and then we all meet together. So I think it's kind of a, a kickstart for that. But again, it just started. So I don't I don't know how that's going to get shaped or formed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Felix, maybe before you um, say what you want to say, just wanted to add to what Anna, or to refer to what you said, Anna. So, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned AI uh, under one kind of, uh, like one concept that relates to many things. And I think what you related to mostly when you talked about the past six months is specifically because the generative AI became available to the general public whereas the industry and many others were working on different AI related and based technologies for, for at least for more than a decade in a very serious manner, let's say that's similar to what we know today. And the you know, initial guidelines uh, that we talked about in this seminar were drafted by different bodies, including WHO and so on. And while they're not uh, one document that everybody goes to and say, this is the, you know, the, the Bible of uh, responsible AI, I, I have to say, and, and, and you have the ESO standards that uh, there, there are a group working on, Amir is connected to that and so on. So there are different standards in, in different uh, kind of uh, bodies that looked at different elements of responsible AI. So I, I don't think we have nothing. And I also think, and it's good to think about the current time as kind of the soft law time. It's less than about regulation, more about let's get some basic standards that we can work with in a way that allows us to, to, to consider how serious this is. And uh, even the laws that are started to be regulated, you, I mean, you don't want to kill all innovation. So you need to find this way of doing something that would be like little sandboxes of uh, kind of uh, uh, initial regulation and so on, not necessarily to commit to the final uh, perfect uh, law that we could all abide uh, by and so on. So I, I think it's it's a, it's a, and, and somebody saying the IEEE, -E, right? So there are different standards that are there for quite a lot of years. Uh, but I still agree with you, Camille, that we, it's good that we have this kind of international community that is starting to be structured. And uh, hearing some of our friends in the industry and different uh, big companies like, like Microsoft and so on saying, we have an interest in self-regulating because first of all, we are a part of the society. We care about what happens, but also at some point we will be regulated. So if we don't regulate ourselves now, what, what are we gonna do with our products in a year? So in a way it has to be done uh, even for practical financially related reasons. This is just how I see it. I'm not saying it's exactly the way. Um, yeah, uh, Felix, yeah. yeah. Camille, I would like to tell you that your uh, lecture was insightful and interesting. Thank you very much. 
I have a question, a, a specific question about the um, uh, medical wearable devices. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how can we be sure uh, about the concern that it, the personal data can be hacked by uh, cyber attacks, for instance, in medical uh, center that was attacked in Israel? I mean, take for, for instance, when the uh, president of the United States would like to be uh, implanted some uh, ECG, yeah, they gave them a version of that not develop, too much development in order to protect him. So how can we be, we be sure that it will be protect our patient? That is an, an excellent question, and I wish I had the answer for it. I just think that, you know, if you are being approached by your clinician who wants to uh, put a pacemaker into your body and then discloses to you, I think this is what you need for your health and for your well-being, but it also can be hacked, and we don't have adequate protections against this being hacked. If it gets hacked, this is what might happen. What are the odds of it getting hacked? I mean, you'd have to be able to disclose this, but um, what's the patient going to choose in the end? Is is that, you know, so I think that this is a, a piece of disclosure, but do, do clinicians now disclose that when somebody's getting a pacemaker? Because I would want to know. Um, but I don't have the answer for it because I don't know how do you, how do you build the device in a way that can be that you can prevent that from happening. That's the new season of Black Mirror is gonna look into. <laughs> yeah. And these are questions that are not just about AI though. They they are questions that relate to data technology, and we've been grappling with them for the past uh, I don't know decade, two decades at least. Yeah. Um, but yeah. but I think the the one thing that may be different in AI is that, and, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I'm just a layperson who don't understand it enough. But I think there's a lot of uh, people in the industry saying that we don't understand it well. Even the people who work with it don't understand it to the fullest. And if you do not really understand the implication of the, the thing that you create, you have fear from it because it can, you know, control you, you know, if we look at it uh, um, poetically. But, you know, it's, I think that's the difference between other innovations and AI generated in them. Yeah, I think a part of that maybe, Shlomit, is not maybe solved, but uh, talking about, for instance, having a person in the loop uh, regarding those tools as tools and not as autonomous decision makers, all these things in the interim may be some way to mitigate to some level what you're referring to. I don't think there would be any uh, foolproof uh, kind of plan, which never mm -hmm. was the case in, in medicine to begin with, or even in medical research, I think. So, um, and, and we've been learning about that over the past six months in this uh, seminar. And I, I, I don't begin to, to say that I have a, you know, a clue what it is that we can still look for in, in a way. But I think the fact that we're doing our best to think about those things, uh, that, that is, that's extremely important. And I think it's also really important that we have stakeholders that are in the industry. So we begin with the, uh, with the phase of design, not, you know, coming later to the party, looking at a product that is already there and asking how could we make it better? That's not a very good plan, is it? I don't want to ask the whole uh, project to, go, to roll back and to relearn everything or whatever, it's not even doable. So in that regard, I think it's really important that uh, many projects are beginning now. A lot of things are starting now or began a month ago. It's important that those people have in mind uh, the potential, the huge potential and risk. Uh, so, so, you know, in, in that regard, I think it's uh, maybe let's be afraid of what's not already planned and make sure that it's planned well. Um, any more questions, thoughts, uh, ideas you want to share with us? Um, okay, so I just, I, you know, it's just a small thing. It's not a big conceptual matter, but I mean, so you talked about, let's say somebody's using GPS-based technology and it could uh, trace uh, locations and maybe patterns and many other things. It could be uh, a love affair. It could be something illegal and whatnot. So in a way, I mean, if you're talking about how the authorities are going to come with a warrant 
and ask to get all the data of illegal immigrants in your research, I can't see that happening. If it does, then it's really a problem that relates to lack of democracy rather than the problem of, of, of research, um, you know, information. So I'm, I'm just thinking. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, so it depends in wh which country it may be done. So uh, why is it such a big issue? I mean, I think if, for, yeah. for people in, in California, um, and especially over the past couple of years, there's just been an elevated sensitivity to being on the border. And people, whether they have um, the appropriate papers or not, felt very vulnerable because they were right. um, more likely to be pulled over or to have people come to their homes to, you know, check for different documents. And I think, you know, so there's just a sensitivity, a higher sensitivity because I live where I do to that. But when we were first starting this research with the wearable camera, um, the way that you could document something, uh, like if you were drinking in a bar and then you get in your car and you happen to have an accident, all of that's documented on the research record. And at least in this, this case, it was a research record. It wasn't a commercial entity. So we had control over the data. But now what is the researcher's responsibility? Do they have a responsibility to report anything? And if they did see something that was reportable, now we know what's reportable, but in some cases, they would never look at those data until six months had passed. And so, you know, it's those decisions that you have to make at the front end of your research about how you're going to handle certain types of data. And with research, we have the ability to keep information um, from being subpoenaed under cer certain circumstances. And so when there's a possibility of, of knowing something that's reportable, we have to tell people in advance. And if we aren't expecting something to be reportable and learn about it later, we have to come up with some plan. And so that happened with, the, um, with our five-year study with older adults. We learned over time that cognitive ability was declining in somebody to the point where they should not be driving a car anymore. And so internally, our group had to come up with a protocol for how will we communicate that to this individual or to their care team. And so, you know, most often we can predict what we might learn, but when we don't get it right, we have to come up with a plan and, and you know, take the appropriate steps. I, I think, uh, like I said, because we are on the border, location data was something that our our participants were very concerned about. So, and and not knowing the technology, I, I don't know who mentioned it, but learning from their students about what the technology could do. Our families, the people that we typically recruit, want to learn from their kids what this technology can do. So when we ask them about their comfort, having a, a GP, GPS location device that they would wear they said they wanted to talk to their children first. They didn't know if it had some kind of radioactivity going on. They didn't know how it worked. So they wanted to vet it with their families. And then they said, well, what if I'm driving with somebody that doesn't have the appropriate papers? Could I somehow implicate somebody else? So really wanting to know the extent of what kind of data could be captured and whether they were putting somebody else in harm's way. So I think learning what those fears are in your populations is really a, just an important way of designing your research so that it's successful. And so that, you know, we do a lot of human-centered design so that we can avoid downstream problems. And that's what we're doing with Bridge to AI with our community advisory council. We're convening people that are representing those who are likely to enroll in the study to learn from them. What are the barriers? What are the facilitators? What what do we need to think about before we kick this off? Yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking from the experience in our uh, research uh, ethics committee that sometimes some researchers, when they submit their requests to have an approval of a research plan, they it seems that they downplay the risks. And I don't think it's done on purpose. I think um, the excitement of doing research, you focus on what it is that you may find. And people sometimes just don't think about those small uh, implications that could be big in some cases. And I, I think what you suggested, a human-centric uh, kind of uh, design, looking at the target audience, maybe a small you know, group 
could make a big difference. I'm also considering, well, you can ask, you know, chat GPT, uh, and you will find that you get surprising uh, creative responses that might be not perfectly constructed, but some of them would include uh, perspectives because you can ask the prompt to include from a perspective of different types of uh, participants, what could be some worries or some cases of whatever. And you may find uh, that you will find, I think, uh, I haven't tried it before, but I tried other things. So that's another thing I'm having in mind. And then just hearing from the experience that you shared with us, so other researchers could start thinking about those things as potential risks, not to hinder research. Actually, if you consider it and you explain how you mitigate it, it's very easy to approve this. So answering Professor talking before about, so I just don't want to do any research, possibly he was uh, joking, but I'm thinking if we know more about the risks, we can actually plan it better so that we are not disregarding those risks. We are willing to take those risks together with the participants when they make sense. You know, that, that's such an important point because when we created CA Notify, which is the exposure notification using the Google Apple technology platform, we noticed we didn't have uh, location data. We had county level data. And we could tell that there were people in this area that were not adopting. And it happened to be um, underrepresented populations, mostly Latino, maybe some refugee. And we did focus groups with those communities. We did two groups in Spanish. And we asked them, what is it about this, the, the, the wording, how we're advertising it? What is it that you're worried about? They didn't know how Bluetooth worked. And they thought Bluetooth was a, a ticket to everything in their phone. They thought if they had Bluetooth on, it was making them completely vulnerable. I didn't know how to explain it. Okay, so I go back to Google and say to the engineers, this is the problem right here. How do we explain this in a way that's a, that makes sense to people? that they know that you've thought this through and that it's the best choice for this for this device. We would have never ever known that had we not talked to people. And so it's a critical part of making any kind of technology or research work in, in practice. Thank you very much. So we are reaching um, the end of our uh, session. If there's something important that any of you would like to add, then now is time to do so. Um, and I uh, would like to thank you, uh, Camille. Uh, it was, uh, I think, an exciting meeting, uh, very important and interesting. And uh, I just want to say to everyone that next week we have our last uh, meeting for this uh, semester. So uh, a week from now, a bit earlier though, uh, towards a path for uh, quality e-mental health services, you're more than invited to uh, join us. And I'm uh, putting the link to our uh, uh, seminars website uh, on chat right now. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.